Survivor Pearl Islands is widely considered the peak of old school Survivor, if you accept All Stars being the end of old school that is. After the previous season, Survivor the Amazon made the show fun again after a painful Thailand, Pearl Islands builds upon that foundation to become what is widely considered one of the best seasons of the show. So does it hold up and how does it fare against previous seasons of the show all these years later? Let's find out. Before we begin, I want to quickly thank you for supporting this channel. Subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing are so crucial to this channel's growth and making all this possible. If you want to do more to help keep the ship afloat, then consider supporting this channel on Patreon. You get all videos before they see the light of day on YouTube, and you get to vote for which survivors I tell the stories of. And you even get an exclusive Patreon-only video each month. Thank you for your support. Number one, the thematic twist. Survivor the Amazon began the trend of thematic twists in the show's history with men versus women, but Pearl Islands does something a little bit different. They didn't cast around the theme or even split up tribes based on a theme. Instead, everything else was just drenched in the theme and that theme was pirate culture. From the epic opening theme song, to the game changing twists, to the challenges, and even down to the music. From the opening of the show where the survivors are given no heads up that the game is starting and have to barter for supplies from a local village, to the treasure chest hunt at their camp, to the season's heroic figure stealing the other tribe's shoes simply because, hey, he's embracing the pirate's life. The other team, Morgan, came up, set their stuff down next to us, and all left. Pirates pillage, pirate steal. There was my stealing. I stole for the Drake. Some things worked and added to the TV show, like one tribe getting to pillage the other tribe after a war challenge, while some things were a bit questionable, like the outcast twist, which completely changed the game for better or for worse, depending on who you ask. Morgan, Drake, your past has come back to haunt you. Come on in, guys. Overall, the theme was a large net positive, and it makes this season as great as it is. The thematic twist for Survivor Pearl Islands gets a 9 out of 10. Number 2. Production Quality A lot of this ties into the thematic twist as everything that was positive from that category and the questionable call about the outcast twist is directly tied to production. However, this is peak Survivor in the old school era. Jeff Probst is firing on all cylinders during challenges, his clear annoyance of fair play and dunking on him multiple times throughout the season does not get old. John hits out of order, John's out of the game, have a seat. One more challenge, John cannot finish. <laughs> and everything is just made fun, which is in large part due to production's decisions. The editing is now at the point where, with the exception of Rupert's boot episode, it was not predictable week to week who is going home, and it was very easy to track who was with who and what was happening at the challenges. However, we have to stop and just mention that the music this season is amazing and you will notice it immediately upon starting. All season it's integrated so well and it seems to be specially made just for this season. And no matter what is happening, it's there and it just enhances everything. Production for Survivor Pearl Islands gets a 9 out of 10. Number 3. Strategic Play After Survivor the Amazon, I thought about how it was great the large strides made that season in terms of strategy. To be fair, it was mostly due to Rob Sesternino, but I thought surely that won't be happening again anytime soon, that was an anomaly. Boy was I wrong, this cast came to play. Blindsides constantly occurred, revenge was had thanks to the outcast twist, players were moved around like pawns on a chessboard, it was seemingly the first instance of voting blocks instead of alliances. It made for a fun time to watch and to analyze. Johnny Fairplay's dead grandma lie was the biggest lie ever seen on this show so far and it was exactly what he needed to help him get further in the game as it made him sympathetic to the other players in the game and swearing on his not actually dead grandma, made some deals happen, and tricked others that may not have been tricked otherwise. Oh, huh? died, dude. John, you went from really happy to really sad. It was either gonna be my buddy or my grandmother coming, and uh, my grandmother's not here for a reason. 
My grandmother's sitting home watching Jerry Springer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra Spybush kept her in the loop as to what was going on and so much more. We saw a real evolution of the game as the winner actively attacked the clear villain of the season out in the open. Once again, the social game prevailed, proving no matter what, the social game is the most important component in terms of how to be successful. Despite having the first official quit in the history of the show, even that showed some social prowess by the Morgan tribe to keep a guy who wanted to leave on day four around until day 19. The strategic play of Survivor Pearl Islands gets a 10 out of 10. Number four, the characters. Characters can make or break a season of Survivor and the order they go out can affect our perception of the season as well. And this cast was loaded. Rupert Boneham, Sandra Diaz Twine, Johnny Fairplay, Lillian Morse, Andrew Savage, Krista Hasty, Burton Robertson, and Austin Taylor were all studs that made this season great, and pretty much all of them didn't get actually booted until the merge. While the other eight castaways were mostly relegated to the background, they all had their moments as well. We had great moments this season from the main characters though. Rupert's obsession with being a pirate, Fairplay's commitment to acting like a WWE heel, Sandra's loud mouth and sassy behavior, Krista's dorky awkwardness, and Lil's emotional roller coaster just makes for great TV. Important things were not just said behind players back to us at home, but actively happened at camp that we are shown, and that is so important. I counted a minimum of seven on-screen fights this season, and I believe Fair Play was a part of most, if not all of them. If you beat me so bad, and I just used my arms, how bad did you beat me? You know what? I can get loud too, what the f I can get loud too. I don't want to John, because he's an ass. Everything that comes out of his mouth is just ridiculous. However, this almost perfect cast is tainted a little bit by Fairplay's sexist remarks that he makes at the beginning of the season and then at the end. It makes him more villainous, so when he goes out, it, it's a little bit easier to root for that happening, but uh, it does cross the line that is inappropriate. Since characters are so important, I give their score twice the weight and the characters score a 9 out of 10. Number five, the winner. This is hard to judge due to the historical context of Sandra Diaz Twine now having played four times and of course winning twice. So to isolate how the winner of the season was received at the time, I went back and read some articles from 2003. And as it turns out, once Rupert is voted out, it seems like Sandra was the second pick to win it all. So once Rupert's gone, everyone's rooting for Sandra, it seemed like. Rupert no doubt would have made for the most satisfying winner of the season, but his game had huge glaring flaws that would not let that happen unless he just won immunities till the end. Sandra as the winner is fun though. She made the anyone but me strategy infamous. They're always fighting. I'm glad it's not me. Let them duke it out. You know, let them kill each other, vote each other off. As long as it ain't Sandra, I'm happy. And for the most part, she remained true to it. She voted out whoever and she didn't care. Now, that's what she says, but when Rupert and Chris both get voted out, she cares. This actually does help her though in the blind side of Burton, which essentially secures her win. Burton was convinced Sandra would truly vote out whoever by the time they reached final five. And because of that, him and Fairplay's games got killed in one vote. The good thing about her though, is she'd vote out her best friend, her worst enemy. She would go to the next level with five people she hated to get to that next level. The beginning of the season and the end of the season prominently feature her, but there are two or three episodes in the middle where kind of, they kind of relegate her to the background as Rupert and Fairplay ate up so much screen time. However, she invented the spy bush, socially manipulated people, and received no votes all game. She literally came one vote shy of playing the first perfect survivor game, which we won't actually see happen until 11 seasons later. The winner of Survivor Pearl Islands gets an 8 out of 10. Should you watch Survivor Pearl Islands? Yes, if you can accept fair play making a few sexist remarks and a twist allowing two players back into the game, it is hard to knock this season. Everything works so well together, and that is in large part due to great casting, great production values, and the strategic gameplay that has you wanting to see what happens next instead of it being predictable with knowing how things are bound to play out. Overall, Survivor Pearl Islands gets a 9 out of 10. Tune in next time as we kick off Survivor All-Stars. Thanks for watching, and if you like the content you see here, then please support me and this channel on Patreon. Your financial support makes all this possible, so thank you, and thank you for watching.